Welcome to the European Interagency Security Forum EISF, training module on security risk management as a basic guide for smaller NGOs. This course comprises the first of several short training courses designed to assist NGOs in addressing the growing insecurity, threats and violence faced during work or when travelling. This first module looks at fulfilling duty of care requirements and developing a security culture as the foundations of effective security risk management as a means of enabling access for and sustainability of programs. The aim of this course is to develop or refine leadership knowledge which can then be translated into sound practice, enabling organisations to protect their people, facilities and assets, operations, information business interests and, critically, their reputation. The course material is based on lessons learned and collective good practice from EISF members and the humanitarian sector. This course is aligned to the EISF guide titled Security Risk Management, a basic guide for smaller NGOs, which can be found within the EISF online publications. For many NGOs, security risk assessments, security plans, travel security procedures, security training and incident reporting is central to their ability to implement programmes effectively. However, smaller NGOs often consider these mechanisms as excessive and too costly to implement. Regardless of the size of the NGO, all organisations have a duty of care to protect their people especially when working within environments with higher levels of risk, and notably where smaller NGOs may lack the support their larger counterparts may benefit from when addressing security and safety risks. It is important to remember that effective security risk management is about enabling programmes, not about becoming risk-averse. The failure to address duty of care requirements appropriately often results in staff experiencing frustration and stress, especially where a significant disparity exists between their organisational approach and other peer groups working in the same environment. And this imbalance in how organisations address danger can easily result in staff feeling that they have been placed at an unacceptable level of risk. In addition, a lack of appropriate duty of care measures can also place the organisation at risk from litigation and reputational harm. As such, all organisations need an effective framework that embeds security risk management practices as an integrated component of organisational planning and operational implementation. When setting out on the daunting task of establishing a security risk management approach, the key questions leadership teams often ask themselves include Where do I start? What are my priorities? And who will undertake the work? This is especially difficult as often those delegated with the responsibility of crafting a security risk management strategy have little or no experience within this area and must contend with developing a strategy while concurrently juggling their primary responsibilities. However, while difficult, the time and effort invested in building an effective security risk management approach will ultimately allow organisations to operate with greater security and effectiveness within insecure environments. The security of staff is impacted by the interplay between where aid workers are, who they are and their role and organisation. Good organisational security risk management takes this into account and recognises staff face different risks depending on their personal profile. It is also important to recognise that often some risk management measures may already be in place or available to you. If your organisation is working overseas, you will already have some risk management systems and procedures in place, although they may not be written down or applied consistently. It is important to build on what already works and learn from the experience of your organisation so you bring staff with you in the process and do not alienate them. A security audit is a good place to start. An important part of defining a security risk management strategy is articulating the differences between security and safety risks. Security is primarily concerned with intentional acts of violence, aggression or criminal acts against staff, assets or property. 
while safety relates to unintentional or accidental acts, events or hazards. While some organizations have a clear separation of the two, often they are interconnected, and most smaller organizations will use the same resources to manage both security and safety issues. This training provides an easy-to-use resource to help smaller NGOs to demystify the management of complex risks by setting out the basic elements of a security risk management framework. By doing this, NGOs can translate their duty of care obligations into key processes and actions that will not only enhance the safety and security of their national and international staff, but will also concurrently improve their organization's reputation and credibility. This training complements other EISF guides, such as the Security Audits Guide, which enables organizations to take stock of what they have in terms of staff security and what needs to be improved, and Security to Go, which focuses on security management systems in the context of a particular location. These documents are also available in French and Spanish. While many NGOs, regardless of their size, recognize their responsibility to protect staff, many organizations still fail to appreciate the full extent of their legal duty of care obligations, as well as any moral duty of care considerations. This has recently been highlighted when Steve Dennis successfully sued NRC for gross negligence following a kidnap from Dadab camp in 2012 as found within To make this matter more complex and increasingly more urgent, both expectations and requirements are increasing, resulting in duty of care through effective security risk management being an obligation rather than an option. Essentially, legal duty of care means that appropriate risk mitigation measures and support structures are in place to prevent and respond to incidents, as far as is reasonably possible and that all staff are appropriately informed of these risks and measures. Duty of care extends beyond just security, with security risk management being but one component of an organization's overarching responsibility for the health, safety and well-being of staff. It is important that organizations consider how identity characteristics such as ethnicity, sexual orientation, ability, etc., affect personal security and build this into their duty of care approach. Duty of care also extends beyond just its staff and may include independent contractors, consultants, volunteers, dependents and official visitors. The level of responsibility the organization has towards an individual is generally determined by the extent to which the organization has control over their work environment and the tasks they undertake as well as their ability to access information relating to the prospective risks they might face. The less control the individual has, the higher the control or influence an organization must assume, and the greater their responsibility. An example includes when an NGO plans a consultant's visit to a country. The NGO plans the itinerary, books the travel arrangements, sources the accommodation, provides local transport, and may provide security services during the trip. As such, the organization is better placed to map, assess, and monitor risks, and so assumes a greater level of duty of care. Where an NGO has no fixed office in country, but deploys individuals and small teams to operate with no local organizational support in country, or where staff are embedded into another organization, then the duty of care obligation may be shared with other organizations. It is critical to understand, however, that the employing organization always retains legal responsibilities to ensure the security risk management approach used by other parties is appropriate to meet these responsibilities. As such, for organizations to appropriately meet their duty of care requirements, they must know the risks, Organizations must be able to demonstrate that they have identified and evaluated all the foreseeable risks that are related to the location, activity and personal identity profiles through a regularly updated and documented risk assessment process. This must be organization-specific 
and reflect both the organization's mandate and the particulars of the team. Establishing mitigation measures. Organizations must take all reasonable measures to manage risks. This includes comprehensive and up-to-date plans, procedures and mechanisms for locations and activities, which meet the needs of all staff, as well as understanding and adhering to local community standards, which demonstrate an awareness of good practice amongst peer NGOs. Develop emergency plans. Detailed plans, measures and assistance must be in place to respond to emergency situations involving staff. Ensure informed consent. Staff must both understand and accept the risks they face and the measures which are in place to protect them. There must be a formal and documented process to reflect this understanding, as well as their own responsibilities in managing these risks. It is important, however, that organisations understand that even signed consent forms do not constitute a legal waiver in a court of law. Raise awareness. Staff must receive detailed and up-to-date information and guidance on risks and in many cases training related to the risks that they are exposed to. And it is important that this is an ongoing process and not a one-off. Provide appropriate support. Organisations must have appropriate support and insurance in place to assist staff affected by an incident. Duty of care applies to all operating environments, whether classified as low, medium, high or extreme risk. However, as the risk levels increase, so often does the need to demonstrate appropriate duty of care measures. Duty of care recognises that not all risk can be removed, but is designed to reflect the reasonableness of actions for foreseeable events and to ensure that staff are provided with the information needed to make an informed decision about the residual risks they could still be exposed to. Further information relating to duty of care can be found with the EISF articles Duty of Care a review of the Dennis v. Norwegian refugee ruling and its implications. And Can You Get Sued? Legal Liability of International Humanitarian Aid Organisations Towards Their Staff. As well as Voluntary Guidelines on Duty of Care to Seconded Civilian Personnel. NGOs have very different levels of risk exposure and attitudes on risk, depending on their mandate and values, the perceived need for or benefits of their activities, and ultimately, their capacity to absorb or manage the risks which their staff are exposed to. NGOs should seek to be risk-aware rather than risk-averse, with organisations seeking to identify their unique risk profile so that they can intelligently determine the level of risk they are willing to accept. The risks that staff may be required to confront should always remain proportionate to the need or benefits of specific activities, the organisation's ability to manage these risks and the consequences if something were to happen. The development of a risk threshold to benchmark the organisation's risk attitude will help to guide decision-making and create a shared understanding of the level of risk the organisation is willing to take. This will also help to know when to escalate decisions up to the management chain to enable higher risk activities to be appropriately authorised, to stop or suspend activities, or withdraw staff where security conditions deteriorate. Key organisational security documents, including the overarching security policy, should include a clear statement on the organisation's attitude to risk, together with information on how these risk thresholds are assessed and the authorisation processes and security measures required in relation to different levels of risk. Multi-mandated organisations may have different risk thresholds depending on the type of programme being implemented, and this too needs to be clearly documented. A positive security culture is key to enhancing staff security. The culture of an organisation is defined as the way we do things around here. And while every organisation has its own unique culture, which is driven largely by the nature of its work and the composition of its team, the security environment and the size of the organisation also has an influence. An inclusive security culture is not just one which states that security and risk management is important. 
Rather, it is one which then does something about these risks through the development of policies, plans and training. And, critically, that these are then communicated and put into practice by all staff, from the top downwards. This then demonstrates both individual and organisational values during the day-to-day -day management of risks. The security culture must also be consistently applied, while taking into account the nuances of different cultures and operating environments. This forms a baseline standard of security risk management, while retaining the flexibility to reflect the unique local conditions. The appointment of an NGO security advisor or a security champion at board level also contributes towards developing and sustaining a positive security culture by raising awareness and defining responsibilities amongst all staff. These champions help to ensure that responsibility for risk management is understood at all levels and that risk management is woven into the very fabric of programme planning and operational activities. The challenge of implementing a cultural shift can be significant and time, focus and effort is required to incrementally adjust attitudes. The lack of money, time and resources is often seen as a barrier to success. And as such, a long-term strategy may yield better results than seeking to create a culture overnight, understanding that a partial security risk management system is better than no system. It is also important to have senior level sponsorship to reinforce the importance of the security culture, typically from the CEO down, and senior leaders should be invited to articulate this importance through both formal and informal messaging. Case study example. I asked one NGO with a well-embedded security culture how they had achieved it. The humanitarian director said it had not happened overnight. The CEO had appointed a global security manager who had developed organization policies and practices that were applied at country level but did not really have buy-in at headquarters. Then a new CEO started. One of the first things she identified was the fact she needed to go on a four-day personal security training, as this was shown as obligatory for any staff wanting to travel to higher-risk context. As soon as she did this, the other senior staff felt they had to follow suit. It was that action that created the cultural shift. Further information can be found in Chris Garrett's Developing a Security Awareness Culture, Improving Security Decision-Making. The following 11 steps are offered as a simple way of developing a security culture. 1. Develop a framework. The framework should outline the organisational approach to security, including the policies, procedures and mechanisms which have been put into place to ensure effective security risk management. 2. Draft a policy. The draft policy should outline the organisation's attitude and key security principles, defining the roles and responsibilities within the organisation for security risk management. 3. Raise awareness. It will be critical to ensure all staff are engaged in what security risk management means, both to the organisation as well as to their activity and for them as individuals, reflecting different staff profiles. This should be reinforced from the top down to reflect the importance and commitment the organisation has to managing risks. 4. Lead from the front. Security risk management is reliant upon people engaging with the approach and this is dependent on top-down leadership commitment and engagement. It should be obvious, consistent and frequent. 5. Provide flexible options. Flexibility is required as no one-size-fits-all approach will work. Local environmental and cultural conditions will influence and shape the approach, building upon the foundations which are defined and articulated by the organisation. 6. Look for quick wins. An early win will create the enthusiasm and drive to motivate further time and effort needed to build a culture around security risk management. This will help longer term and more difficult goals to be started, completed and then sustained. 7. Report, report and report. Staff must understand the importance of reporting incidents and near misses, as well as sharing their concerns, experiences and observation with others in order to contribute to the security risk management strategy, as well as to record the history of incidents. 8. Establish security forums. 
security should be included as an agenda topic within leadership meetings, and a community of practice should be built around security risk management, where security issues and challenges can be raised, discussed and ultimately resolved. 9. Monitor and review. Security risk management is a live process, and periodic and event-driven reviews will ensure that it is sustained and adjusted to reflect shifts in the risk conditions. 10. Enforce accountability. Mechanisms must be established to hold people accountable for security, including potentially including security risk management responsibilities as part of annual job performance metrics. And 11. Celebrate success. Security risk management should be seen as a positive enabler rather than as a negative impediment to work. As such, champions should be engaged to promote the approach and so create more positive impacts with better supported outcomes. Invariably, there will be costs associated with managing security which will compete with other priorities. These may be monetary or in the form of time and resources. For smaller organisations, this can present a challenge as funds, focus and effort may be limited. However, it is important to understand that many measures require little time, money or effort and once implemented can be simple to sustain. This may include recognising and documenting existing organisations procedures as well as using open source templates, tools and resources through EISF and interaction which can be easily adapted to meet the unique needs of the organisation, as well as online training resources which help to raise staff awareness and capacity. There is also a growing acceptance by donors that staff security is essential for programmes within insecure areas and as such Costs may be partially or fully funded if the need and benefits are well presented. This may range from funding security assessments and audits, establishing security positions, purchasing security assets, improving facility security and safety measures, and providing training to leaders and staff. Ideally, costs should be defined and articulated when funding is initially being sought Although changes to the risk environment can also provide a catalyst for requesting additional funding to meet security needs. Further information can be found in the EISF paper, The Cost of Security Risk Management in NGOs. A good security manager is one who places safety and security into the context of the organisation, its mission and goals, budget and operational constraints and its operating environment. A good security manager is not only a security expert, but also understands business, projects, finance, contracts and legal factors which shape how the organisation approaches its work and can communicate within and between organisations effectively. Security enables all other core functions and so must be woven into the fabric of how organisations think, plan and implement. This opening introduction and part one of the series of micro-learning courses on security risk management, a basic guide for smaller NGOs, lays the foundations for effective security risk management. Understanding that ultimately success depends on where organisations place security in terms of prioritisation and how well it is embedded within the operations of the organisation as a whole, rather than as an add-on. It is important that the approach is scalable, flexible and builds upon early easy wins in order to encourage further time, money and investment into the process of not only protecting people and projects but also the wider interests of the organisation. Leaders should understand that although any approach adopted must be led from the top down, it must be inclusive and reflect the needs of the staff and not be seen to be just imposed. Security risk management must be integrated into the business cycle during the process of seeking donor funding, through to program planning and operational implementation as yet another component of how the organisation works. 
security should not be treated as a standalone strategy, removed and separate from other functions. It complements and supports every aspect of how organizations think and work. We would also like to thank Risk and Strategic Management, Corp or RSM for offering to script and visualize this training as a free contribution to supporting the humanitarian aid and development community.